get started with our next webinar in Mazur Consulting's educational webinar series. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, the presentation today is called Data Fusion for Transportation Projects, um, Developing a Comprehensive Survey Data Set. Kind of get into what that means uh, to us. Uh, just to let you know, I'm Michael Earhart, um, Geographic Discipline Leader with Mazur Consulting in our Tampa and Orlando regions. We're going to be talking about how we use all of the tools in our geospatial toolbox at this day and age, technology and, and conventional approaches to surveying and mapping, bringing that all together to produce a data set that is more comprehensive than in the past. And that really equates to benefits to both us as professionals and our clientele. And we're going to focus that on transportation with a specific case study, uh, but also talk about how this can be applied in, in various different project instances. So just wanted to go over the components of data fusion that we'll be talking today. As, as I mentioned, we're looking at all the tools in our toolbox as geospatial professionals in today's day and age. Um, depending on the project, and again, we're looking at mainly transportation, this could be uh, many different sources of information from existing survey data, potentially, uh, previously uh, collected information for applications like design build projects to mobile LIDAR, which we typically use on, on hard surfaces and roadway corridors, static LIDAR, which is your, your traditional laser scanning on a tripod mounted uh, uh, system. And that could be for bridges or other infill of, of mobile LIDAR, aerial LIDAR, whether that's fixed wing aerial LIDAR, drone LIDAR, which we're now using in our industry uh, to capture ground terrain or even hard surfaces, depending on the application. And then aerial imagery, uh, which can be very beneficial to any project that we're on from quality control to design decisions for our, our clientele. And of course, conventional survey, which none of these other tools really uh, can be leveraged without to do control, uh, things like ponds, ditches, drainage information, and we're going to talk how these all come together to help us potentially expedite projects, uh, benefit uh, our clientele with more design decision support, as we call it. You know, having more information can lead to a lot better engineering product at the end. And how we uh, how we really combine all this with with good practices and uh, good quality control procedures to make sure that at the end of the day we're confident, our clients are confident, and uh, and we can have a successful project. So going into our next slide, I just want to talk about kind of the areas in transportation that we typically look to do data fusion. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of your most apparent application, which is corridor mapping or road design. We're going to be talking about a widening project today, but really any corridor, you know, you're looking, you have a mix of features on corridors from a surveying or geospatial, you know, scope of work. And that'll be the hard surfaces I mentioned, potentially bridges ground surfaces, drainage, ditches, uh, structures, things of that nature. Um, obviously, this could also be used for a litany of other projects or applications. We see a big uh, need to use data fusion in conceptual planning, such as PD&E studies. You know, there's statewide LIDAR, aerial LIDAR uh, from a, a lot of consultants can capture these days. That combined with appropriate conventional survey or these other tools that I'm discussing, can be a very powerful planning tool that you know can be captured very efficiently, very cost effectively, especially with existing information like a statewide aerial LIDAR. Uh, and that can be a huge benefit to these kind of projects. Asset inventories is, is a, another great ad, uh, application. You know, we're combining mobile LIDAR with aerial LIDAR constantly on big sign inventories uh, or uh, large other uh, inventories for structures because of the benefit of seeing an overview with aerial imagery, but the detail you need out of mobile LIDAR to capture some of the, the asset information uh, required by different agencies. Um, cross slope analysis for resurfacing projects, typically resurfacing is a very straightforward project intent, uh, but the detail you can get from a combination of LIDAR and other tools can really benefit um, you know, the engineering uh, decisions made on a project. We're looking at things like cross slope, overhead clearances, is a very similar uh, benefit to that. Curve advisory is a another uh, application which which we are using 
things like LIDAR and other tools to, to develop. Uh, Paul DiGiacobi, um, our geospatial director, uh, has probably a presentation that we will share eventually uh, in this series to discuss curve advisory analysis, specifically using mobile LIDAR can be an extremely beneficial tool. And for what we've seen, a reduction in cost and time in, in, in those applications by upwards of 30 to 40 percent. Design build projects is another great case for uh, for fusion of information. As I mentioned on the on the last slide, existing survey data is a tool that we need to be able to leverage or a source of information that we need to be able to leverage specifically in design build projects where information has already been gathered. But that that leads to our ability to qualify the data to perform QAQC on it and take ownership as uh, surveying and geospatial pro professionals. So using these other tools that we're talking about, mobile, aerial, conventional means, uh, will allow you to, to vet that information and, and, and leverage it for your, uh, your projects. So lots of applications that we can get into, but uh, today we're going to look kind of at a case study on a very uh, straightforward project that we've been doing uh, multiple of these with um, the agency that we're talking about. This one's Central Florida Expressway uh, and the 417 widening project that we performed last year uh, from Landstar Boulevard to Boggy Creek Road that's in Orlando, Florida. Uh, the, the Central Florida Expressway is doing multiple widening projects throughout this uh, system on 417, also on State Route 429. So we've used this similar approach on now three different projects for the expressway. We're doing the same thing on design builds for the Florida Turnpike and even smaller sites, uh, such as a, a golf course site, where you have a combination of different tools and fusing that data appropriately can really lead to exponential benefits uh, for us as, uh, as we approach it with survey and also our clients as they look at the engineering needs on a project. So for this project, we thought it was a very good uh, application to discuss with you just to give you some background on the project because we're going to be looking at some images of it. It was a roadway widening project, widening to the inside median and also to the outside in many cases of about uh, four and a half miles of roadway. This is an aerial view. The uh, project's actually going east to west on your screen. This is just a large interchange at the termination of uh, Boggy Creek Road for the project about 38 lane miles of uh, access highway. So that's all the ramps, side streets, and, and lanes on this corridor. All this work was performed within the right-of-way, but we'll talk about the actual scope of work, which required survey outside the right-of-way as well. There was about 10 bridges. You can see quite a few of them on your screen in the background that were affected by this project. So that's where more information uh, was uh, definitely a necessity and why we fused data was detail on bridges for widening and for clearances specifically. There was about 100 acres of off pavement survey. So that's basically anything that isn't your hard surface roadway uh, throughout the project for um, drainage design, sound wall design, basic topographic information that was required to do the widening uh, for the slopes that they were developing and ultimately constructing on the project and the schedule. I want to bring up the schedule because that is another aspect of this fusion of information is how we address compress schedules. And this one was a, a fairly uh, expeditious schedule, 18 month design schedule, and really a ultimately three month survey schedule for four and a half miles, which you know, in my opinion is, a, is an aggressive schedule, but uh, that's what we had to work with. So again, we, we use these tools that we're going to talk today to meet or exceed that schedule and ensure we had success on the project. So we'll get into why did we choose data fusion specifically for this project, but again, some of these benefits that we'll talk about can be applicable on any transportation project. Uh, it just depends on what tools you have in your toolbox and, and understand how to, to effectively use them. So as a, uh, this one, we use a combination of conventional survey. I'll get into the scopes of those, those tools, but static LIDAR, mobile LIDAR, and drone LIDAR specifically on this project. Um, one of the big pushes, I mentioned the three month schedule, but there was also a timeline of 15% light and grade needed to happen very early in the project. So the design team requested that we have a survey of the pavement. So a digital terrain model of all the hard surface pavement on the project within the first three to four weeks of the project. So very challenging, um, you know, schedule duration on that, but 
Again, utilizing these approaches, we were able to meet that. I'll show you how we did that. And we captured those 100 uh, plus acres of off pavement uh, information with mainly drone based aerial LIDAR. And that resulted in a significant reduction up to 40% in the overall cost of our, of our project or our survey uh, scope of work. So the key reasons we, we chose to fuse all this information together and, and have this kind of comprehensive approach was obviously number one, which is a big uh, focus of Maser Consulting specifically and that's safety. Uh, that's also, I'm sure, on everyone's mind these days. The nice thing about the tools that we're seeing and advances in technology in our industry is the ability to make our our people, our staff, and the public uh, a more safe in a more safe aspect on these projects. So we're reducing the the needs of accessing the roadway, especially on a limited access highway that can be very dangerous. So it's obviously something we want to take into account on every project. As I mentioned, the speed um, that reduction in schedule and, and and aggressive schedule was a huge reason we 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 leverage this information and a huge benefit to the overall success of the project the coverage uh was another one i mentioned the, that off pavement information and the improvements not being within the right of way but in order to calculate drainage in order to build sound walls up near the right of way of this uh roadway the uh design team needed information to about 30 to 40 feet outside of the right of way uh, of the project. So utilizing remote sensing and this fusion of data, we did not need to access the private property in able to uh, get them the information they need, which is again, that leads to safety, that leads to speed of the project and overall success. And then detail. These tools, as we mentioned, you know, need to be the right ones for the job. And when it comes to information such as detailed bridge structures and as building of more complicated features on this job, utilizing uh, a fusion of LIDAR and conventional survey gave us a much more detailed uh, information and, and data set to provide to our engineers, which they needed. So the bridges, the topology, and the overall, that quick pavement DTM was a very detailed one because we leveraged things like LIDAR uh, for our engineering team. So some of the equipment uh, and I keep mentioning, uh, I wanted to kind of display on our screen. There's a lot of tools in, in the survey or geospatial toolbox these days. What we use specifically on the project were a few of our Leica um, P40 terrestrial laser, laser scanners, our mobile LiDAR system, which was the VMX 1HA, and we used what you see on the bottom there, our Vapor 55 uh, drone system outfitted with a Regal Vux LiDAR sensor to capture that off-pavement LiDAR information. So those are the tools that, that we're pulling from, and again, to combine into this, this comprehensive data set. So what we really do on any onset of a project, and I think this is what you need to do when you're, when you're contemplating using different pieces of equipment together to, to ultimately ensure the success and uh, the overall expectations of a project is significant planning on the front end. And some of the imagery that I'll be showing you uh, is the result of that planning. So first and foremost, a detailed um, project plan of where we're using different tools in our toolbox that I keep mentioning uh, and where they are most beneficial to the project. And we'll show you that. Uh, a specific operations plan, and we did that in this case specifically because of some of the challenges with the UAS or drone uh, airspace and coverage on this project. It's a, it's a large project to use drones on, and uh, we wanted to ensure our client and the authorities' confidence in that approach. And so I'll show you that as well. Then quality control. Obviously, when you have multiple data sets, shared information, we want to ensure a good relative streamlined, you know, uh, merging of all that information to create the product that we expect to, to deliver to all of our clients. And then expectations for deliverables. So really understanding the needs of the project and backing in an approach using these tools that's going to get us to that that finish line most effectively, most efficiently, and uh, in accounting for cost and schedule. So first we'll look at that Google Earth plan that I wanted to tell you about. And these are a few images that just show a portion of this four and a half mile project, but these all tie together uh, to show you where the scope really leveraged the different tools and, and Fusion was, was successful. So this is the pro uh, a glimpse at the project control needed to use these different uh, tools and technology on the project. 
Um, we have primary uh, control on the project, which basically goes in the construction plan set. Those are the red dots along uh, mainly the, the median of the roadway, uh, which were performed uh, you know, conventionally with GPS and digital levels to establish good uh, horizontal and vertical information throughout the, the life of the project. And then adding to those or densifying off of that information, we set all of our remote sensing and conventional survey control. So the items in green that you see are mobile LIDAR targets that were set off pavement or on the shoulders of, of the pavement for us to control and process the mobile LIDAR that was collected on the job. Uh, the white uh, ground control points that you see are along some of the, the, the lateral areas of the project were additional control we set for that aerial drone LIDAR efforts on the project to give us the control we needed in combination with the mobile LIDAR data set uh, to be able to tie everything down to one consistent basis. And that really is the point of how you make these data fusion projects successful. It all starts with control and the conventional means of how you establish them. So the next Google Earth um, you know, project planning tool we did was identify ground surveys. So conventional survey still has a place whenever you're using remote sensing because there is just places where you are not going to be able to leverage the, that technology. Specifically on this project, that focus was ponds, you know, wet areas, the, the LIDAR that we're talking about cannot penetrate uh, water because of refraction. So we were conventionally uh, approaching those ponds and any heavily wet or vegetated areas with conventional means, typically total station or GPS if, if, if uh, from a, from a uh, application where the skies were clear enough to use that, we did that. So all the drainage structures throughout the entire project, the manholes, the uh, catch basins, the culverts, those were collected, con collected conventionally, as were these ponds and, and areas that we identified utilizing a tool that's so easy, Google Earth, to say we know we're going to have to get in there and work on these areas to supplement all this other information. And now we'll look at some of those remote sensing uh, planning uh, applications. As I mentioned, mobile LIDAR was key for us for all the paved surfaces, both on the main line and also the side roads or intersecting roadways to get us underneath the bridge structures uh, of the main line of the project because they'd be widening those bridge structures. Uh, so our plan was to collect all of those with mobile LIDAR. And here is that coverage that we're getting from mobile LIDAR. And I'm going to show you this image again as we fuse data together. So pretty comprehensive uh, when you look at the corridor itself, as you can see, there's a limitation laterally, and that's why we decided to go to our next step, which was the coverage using aerial LIDAR, in this case, drone LIDAR, to collect all that off pavement information. So flying around those pond areas along the right of way and ensuring we're outside of any, you know, um, public roadway when doing this, not over people or cars or any of that to follow federal and state regulations. So we flew the right of way basically of this project uh, to capture that off pavement information that we spoke about. And this is that data set. So you can see much more coverage, uh, I keep mentioning, outside of the right of way, which you can almost see as a faint fence line in the project. Uh, and then less information in the middle, because again, due to, due to the regulations and, and safety of, of utilizing these tools, we're not flying over the roadway itself. But when you combine all this coverage, right, all these conventional means, LIDAR, aerial mobile, we get a data set that, com that is extremely comprehensive, right? So now we have outside of the, uh, the, the right of way by plus or minus 30, 40, 50 feet, if not more, and we have full coverage of all the paved surfaces and off pavement surfaces of the project. Now, getting into that operations plan, I mentioned we did this specifically for our, our UAS um, application on the project because that is something that a lot of uh, industry professionals are are still, you know, not accustomed to seeing on a project. But we wanted to build confidence into our engineers and our our ultimate client, the authority. So we put a very detailed plan in, showing obviously our our professional licensure, our certifications to to operate. Um, the systems that we're talking about, but where and how we were going to use them to again ensure that we knew what we were doing and they knew what we were going to be doing in coordination efforts. So I'll show you a little bit of what we the challenges we deal with 
when leveraging you know, uh, a, a drone-based LiDAR system on a project like this. Fortunately and unfortunately, this project is right by the Orlando International Airport. It's actually due north of uh, basically the right half of your screen in the presentation. So we were dealing with significant altitude restrictions based on our, our, uh, our location, you know, as compared to the, uh, to the airport. So you see uh, up in the top box a legend, each color of these uh, 3D polygons that cover the ultimate scope of work that we were doing was a different altitude restriction that we had to take into account as we flew the operations on this project. So obviously very warranted to, to prepare and to plan out an, an application like this and also present this to both the Central Florida Expressway, our clients, and coordinate with the International Airport to ensure that you know they knew of our expectations and what we were doing. This is a, a planning um, overview of where we were flying the LZ or pin marks that say LZ in Google Earth are our landing zones and takeoff zones for the different flights that we acquired with the uh, drone LiDAR. Again, as you see, we're ensuring we're staying outside of the roadway surface by a good margin, typically 30 to 40 feet outside. But because of the swath and angle of uh, information we're able to collect with the LiDAR unit off that drone, we still had all the coverage we needed and wanted if not more, even being off of that pavement surface a significant amount. So again, that just allowed us to plan these efforts so they went extremely smoothly and efficiently in the field. It took us a total of two days to fly four and a half miles of plus or minus 100 acres of off pavement information with that system. So very efficient way to collect data on such a corridor with this approach. So what does that mean overall? I told you the, the issues that we're dealing with definitely uh, heavily controlled airspaces uh, and safety. And that's why we decided to use these tools, the accelerated schedules that I mentioned and fusing this information is, is definitely a challenge, right? If you don't know what you're doing with it and you don't have a good plan in place to approach it, then it's not gonna be successful. So what we did as we started the project and actually got uh, our notice to proceed is we set all the control for the project and for all the different means of data collection on the project. So that was the mobile targets, the aerial targets, the conventional uh, control and primary control network on the project. We did that with a teaming partner, WBQ Engineering and Surveying, to ensure that that critical path point, which is that information, that control, was done as efficiently uh, as possible up front in the job. And then we went and acquired this LIDAR information, both with our mobile sensor and our drone sensor, both out there at the same time, collecting four, uh, you know, over four miles of corridor, millions and millions of points of LIDAR information, all done within one to two days of collection. So that really gets us ahead of the game when we talk about that schedule, because we have so much data then to review and utilize to help feed our design team. Our next step was to process and review, and then ultimately merge that LIDAR data uh, together first, and then subsequently with the conventional or other data collection means like the static LIDAR da data we performed under some of the bridges. Then we extracted surface features from all that information. So that means developing that digital terrain model of the pavement first, which we now have all the data we need to get that into our engineer's hands immediately. And then ultimately, all the planimetric features, things like trees, signs, light poles, which weren't on the critical path in that first three to four weeks of the project to get line and grade, but ultimately needed to be completed and mapped uh, in three to four months. So we then put our attention to those features. Next step was to merge with the conventional survey information. So as we processed, reviewed, extracted, and mapped this information, we had conventional field operations ongoing on the project for those first you know, month or two of the project to capture all that drainage, inverts and elevations, any of those obscure areas that I mentioned that we identified in Google Earth. Uh, also, we dealt with a, a very significant channel, which is what you see on the right hand of your screen. There's a huge channel underneath uh, that, and that's actually Boggy Creek proper, which was collected with conventional means and with static LIDAR to capture the detail under those bridges uh, that were needed for widening. Once all that was merged together and the real 
reason it was able to be merged together again relates back to control. All the control was a shared data set between the LIDAR systems, the conventional means, and that and that resulted in a very easy merging of this information. We then QC'd the overall product and delivered the base mapping and final uh, digital terrain model. This is a quick video just showing the operations on uh, I'll try to run through it quickly. So again, this is the system taking off and we'll show some of the point clouds you're seeing. What I wanna reiterate is the reason that we share the control uh, along these systems. So as you can see, this is the highway and this is where we're flying with the, with the aerial LIDAR. What we can see with the aerial LIDAR obviously overlaps all the pavement surfaces where we have mobile LIDAR information. We hold that mobile LIDAR information to the control and utilize the same control for the drone aerial information, those data sets become perfectly aligned. We can share that, that, that control, the trajectories of the GPS, which is how we process the information, and we can ensure that there is a seamless fusion of these two data sets. And once you bring in conventional means, and you know you're using the same information, same control for those, that fusion is then completely seamless with that data as well. So moving on to kind of that control, I wanna show you the results of that control. The information that you're seeing here is, is a combination of things. It's fairly technical, but what you're seeing are points, which were the control points for the project and their deviation from that. So ultimately the, the average root mean squared error of the project and the tolerances that we were looking for. Here's a cross section of the aerial and mobile data. And again, the derivation between the data sets. What it really comes down to is the information you see on the right hand side of your screen. The UAS LiDAR data was less than a tenth of a foot in both horizontal and vertical off the control when we registered everything together for off pavement survey information that was well within our tolerances that we were looking for on the project. The root mean square error of all the validation points, which were check shots again that we took for the mobile LIDAR, uh, was within two hundredths of a foot in, in X, Y, and Z, so much more accurate than we even required, so very successful use of the control there. And then we actually had independent cross-sections performed by our teaming partner, WBQ, to validate the product, and that is really an important step. I especially like it from an independent source, you know, a partner that has no skin in the game, if you will, to ensure that that final product we're developing exceeds the expectations and needs of the job. So overall, there's an average of one foot um, derivation of the DTM to these check shots, and mainly that's in the off pavement areas and the roadway. We are at five hundredths of a foot or better, and that the off pavement, you know, from uh, from that average anywhere to two tenths of a foot on off payment. So extremely good results from an accuracy standpoint. We've also listed the density of information. So per square meter, thousands of points, which is uh, obviously what gives us that very comprehensive data set. And then at the end of the project, we compare that DTM to the full LIDAR data set, cross-sectioning through the information like you see in the middle of your screen to ensure it all lines up properly prior to, uh, to delivering the job. So, just to get into the final slides here and the results of this project, we met and actually exceeded that compressed schedule for three months of survey. And that was due to this fusion of tools, fusion of, of, of approach to this job and planning it out significantly at the front end. And then obviously putting a lot of, of effort into the project along with our teaming partners. Uh, we leveraged mobile LIDAR, produced that interim submittal of, of the roadway and looking at things like you see to the right, critical clearances for the job, both with overhead power lines and bridges. There's so many added value information that you can pull from these kinds of data sets to keep the design team moving forward, to keep the project moving forward and to ensure their success. So using you know, um, our teaming partners like WBQ, we handle the control, the LIDAR targeting, those predefined obscure areas that I showed you in Google Earth and all the LIDAR collection all of that was up, done up front within the first month of the project. So that's a pretty significant effort. And then we moved on to you know, drainage and other areas that were less of an importance for the design team, but that's a very hard push in the front end. And we did that successfully because of all the tools that we discussed here today. I also wanna to touch on design decision support. I think I mentioned that earlier on, 
the added value we get from having this fusion of data are all the different things that we can pull out of it to help a successful design uh, and to feed the multiple designers on this project. There's structure uh, engineering going on, geotechnical engineering, lighting, you know, ITS, and they all have specific needs as it comes to survey, and those needs might not be apparent until they get into the project. Having a data set like LIDAR allowed us to address their requests for additional information very efficiently uh, and with very little you know, cost uh, to the project whatsoever. So we handled those, uh, um, those additional requests either with additional conventional survey, if that need be on the project, but also with just pulling more information out of the data set. So even for these bridges that we're showing you, a key point was seeing those MSE walls. There's patterns on the walls which dictate where the structural members are behind the actual MSE wall facade. So giving a point cloud to the structure team allowed them to, to detail out those, you can kind of see them in this image, hex, hexagonal patterns, uh, and that was a huge benefit to them. Modeling all the girders and abutments and beams on the project allowed our structural engineers to be very confident in how they're going to widen and, and actually resulted in finding issues with the as-built construction documents that they were using for this project. They were incorrect, and, and that's, that's a potential and something we've seen on a lot of projects. So having this detailed information and confidence in it, because we can see every beam and nook and cranny, we we're able to model those and give them a true as-built for those features. Overall, the benefits of this data fusion, safety, 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 as we mentioned earlier, are the multiple data collection methods that allows our staff to be out of the roadway, out of harm's way, and keeps the public out of harm's way, both from an aerial and a mobile perspective. We talked about expediting these project schedules. It allows us to do more projects faster, which is great, and allows us to tackle interim or, or predefined submittals to keep the design process moving without waiting to an end product uh, for the design team. High resolution or that detail that I mentioned, a combination of that mobile LIDAR and a low altitude uh, aerial LIDAR on this project resulted in what you can see in these images as a, as a extremely high resolution. So we're able to see, you know, details of the pavement for running, for scalloping that, that equate to cost and, and value when it comes to actually paving and reconstructing these roadways. And then the same thing for off pavement, we're able to get a very detailed DTM to define drainage and topology for the project. The confidence that we had because of the shared control for all these data sources was exemplary. We knew that we had a, a product that we could stand behind. And then, as I mentioned, in design, design decisions, there's limited, limitless uses for, for all this data. The project challenges were that coordination with both access to the project, the FAA, the uh, the uh, airport right next door and preparing for those, but we handled those with that operations manual and it went fairly smoothly. Uh, this was a new approach, but now we've done it, as I mentioned, three, four times on transportation projects. So it's a very competent approach in my opinion at this point. Uh, and we did have you know, a challenge of support with multiple team members, but because we planned it out very detailed and effectively in the beginning, uh, ultimately that went off without a hitch. This is the final product, a very uh, comprehensive and detailed digital terrain model, 3D structures and, and modeling for as built. We think it was very successful and I hope that showing you some of this information today allows you to think of ways to fuse data together, to use all the tools that are available in our professional toolboxes uh, in this industry to ultimately find ways to make your projects more successful and, and to take on the challenges that we're all facing, which is faster, cheaper, and better at the same time. And I think we can do that by looking towards technology and the fusion of this information. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Maria's probably been monitoring your chat to function to see if there's any questions. We'd love to tackle those as time allows for the remainder of this presentation. This pro uh, presentation will also be recorded and is recorded and will be provided should you want to go over and look at any of our pretty pictures and information that I, I described today. Uh, so please reach out to us at surveywebinars at maserconsulting.com for any of that information or follow up. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first question comes from Joe in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, in the slide that you shared, the 40% reduction in off payment survey, could you break that down better? And uh, how did you come to that number? So, thank you, Maria. What we looked at uh, is actually we put together in a full estimate of this project without the use of aerial LIDAR because we knew that was, was potentially an unknown because this is one of the first projects in the state where we use drone LIDAR. Um, we put that estimate together with conventional approach to all the off pavement, that 100 acres of topology that we'd need a map, we need to get outside of the right of way with. And then we put together an estimate utilizing the approach that you see that we ultimately performed and compared those two, uh, those two estimates. And not only you know, is, was there a 40% reduction in the cost of the overall survey scope, but obviously that also meant an expedite, an, uh, an expeditious schedule benefit because of the need to fly everything in, or the ability to fly everything in one to two days versus what ended up being uh, plus or minus 30, you know, days in the field to capture all that information. So that's really where that cost benefit comes to, but I don't want to leave out the fact that not only is, is a cost that we're always challenged with, but it is schedule. And that's why we went with the approach we did here. Okay, thank you. This question is from Tim. Uh, how are you mitigating the fuzz you get with drone LIDAR? One, uh, we have several products using this and none of the LIDAR was very good due to the drone weight and quality of the You broke up at the end of that question, Maria, but I think I got the gist of it. Um, so, I'd love to have more cross sections up here. And, and I think Joe was the one who answered that. And we're happy to, to share what we saw in the project was actually extremely, I don't know, amazing to me. Uh, we were within eight to six to eight hundredths uh, accuracy on the pavement with the drone I LIDAR as compared to the mobile. But we knew drone LIDAR is not as accurate for hard services. And that's why we did mobile LIDAR. But for the off pavement, the fuzz you're talking about. We mitigated that with the sensor we're using. We're using a multiple return LIDAR regal sensor, and we were able to penetrate that grass and vegetation. Now, there are some areas where it's wet, where water and, you know, in, incursion happens, and we knew that we'd have to capture that conventionally, but we were able to confidently do that with the check sections and the check shots we took because we used the lowest elevation of all, all that LIDAR data that penetrated the vegetation and using the tools in TopoDot, which is the software we use in MicroStation to extract and build that information, it really did not become an issue with us. Again, it's knowing the limits of those tools that we're using where they're not gonna be successful and not pushing those boundaries necessarily because you know that could lead in a potential overrun or issue on your project. So we really identified that and knew uh, ahead of time where the aerial lighter was going to be good and where it wasn't and and the results um, confirmed that for us. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is from Julie in Florida. Given the obvious time savings, what becomes your critical path on your project? So I think I mentioned it. Um, what, what happens when we're utilizing all this data and we want to get all this collection up front, the survey control becomes the critical path scope item, if you will, that has to be done efficiently and effectively. And without it, none of this fusion of information can happen without having quality control and without getting it done up front so that we can process all this data and start delivering the products that, that our engineer needs uh, uh, you know, very soon in the schedule as it obviously was, it cannot happen. So the survey control is a must. And that's why we had multiple teaming partners, as I mentioned, two surveyors, Go, you know, addressing that critical path item from the get go for all the control information. And we ultimately did that very quickly and, and very confidently, which was good. Okay, thank you. Um, Marvin's question is what is the payload for the rotary UAV in presentation? In presentation? So, Paul, I think Paul Jacoby's on this and can back me up. Uh, I think the payload we're running on the Vapor 55 system, which I showed to you today, is about 11 pounds maximum. And I don't know if, if Paul can chime in and confirm on that for me, but uh, really we max out the the load uh, capacity with that LIDAR unit. So you really can't carry much more than that LIDAR unit, but that's really the best combination of, uh, of equipment we found to produce the results that we're getting, like we're showing you here today. Yeah. Hey, Mike, Paul here. Yeah, I believe you're right. It's somewhere around 11 pounds. And uh, 
with the copter and the payload of the of the uh, the UAS liner were right at 55. So that's kind of maxed out from a small UAS perspective. Thank you, Paul. Okay, this is an additional question from Marvin. He asked, um, are you able to merge the post process point cloud data sets derived from different platforms, UAV, LIDAR plus mobile LIDAR? Yes, that's that's ostensibly what we did. And because we're using the same systems, Regal, um, you know, uh, LIDAR systems, and we had all this redundancy or, or you know, shared control, uh, we were actually able to process the trajectories and, and then we're getting a little technical, but the trajectories of both LIDAR systems in concert with each other in the same project, which allowed us to really utilize all that information to create that seamless fused data set and to ensure that it, there wasn't going to be a big discrepancy between each data set. You know, if you're provided with aerial LIDAR information or you're pulling from an open source like statewide LIDAR, or you have a consultant doing aerial LIDAR instead of doing it in-house like we did it here on, on this presentation, that's also all the basis of control and the means and methods to which that data was collected. So if you have a good handle on the metadata and how it was established, you can merge this information confidently as long as you have that information and you perform the checks like we did both with conventional means or with additional LIDAR means to uh, to ensure that you can stand by that product and fuse that information together. In okay. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, this is, a, this is uh, another question. This is his last question and I think we have time for one more. Um, is it possible to begin to begin feature extract extraction prior to target panel surveys, then repro reproject mapping once the surveys are complete? It, it is possible. Um, obviously, time is of the essence when we're looking at this project. So you can process the, pro the, the LIDAR information basically without that final control to start mapping or extracting features. And actually, Topo Dot, as I, as I mentioned, a tool we're using has a very good function to translate those linear or or specific items back to the new process data set when it comes out we do that depending on on the project uh the only issue can be the potential scaling and translating may be more significant than really is appropriate for the job especially when you look at vertical changes and tight tight features like curve and gutter if that information moves once you control it a significant amount it's going to be hard and you're going to ultimately do more QC to validate that translation on the back end than it potentially would have been just to process it and extract it from the get go with controlled information. So it's doable, but that is a, a case by case scenario that I typically look at. Um, if we have the ability, I'd much rather finalize those data sets or just agree to specific items that are more relative measurements like the uh, bridge clearances we showed you were actually done without any control prior to getting all that control finalized and processed. We pulled out a lot of those clearances to help with some initial design decisions for the design team. And that's a completely relative measurement uh, that's a, that you know, you're able to collect or, or produce off of that data. Okay, thank you. And this is the, uh, will be the last question. This is from Sergey. He asked, how accurate is the one day if you use the same CT as PCT? How do you your I, I lost everything you said in that one, Maria. I apologize. Uh, it was breaking up. Can you oh. try that again? Okay. <laughs> or, or send me a message of what it was? Um, I'll read it one more time. How accurate is the one D if you use the same CTL points as GCP? I only got at the very end using the same CTL points as GCP. I think that's what, what the basis of your question was, was kind of you leveraging that control for the aerial. Is that, is that what it was, Maria? Um, you know, I apologize. My connection's poor right now, so I will follow up with an email. Oh, I can hear you now if you want to try one last time. Okay. Uh, you know, Mike, I think I'll just follow up with an email. Okay. So right now, I apologize. So um, that's it with the with the Q and A. Well, thank you, Maria. I know you're 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 breaking up, so we will follow up with any of the, the 
additional questions you have, as I mentioned on your screen, please reach out to us at Survey Webinars at Mazer Consulting. And uh, we hope that you'll join us for more of these educational web series. And uh, please let us know if we can be of any help. Thank you again for your attendance and have a good rest of your day.